Hi there, would you look at this? I'm not in my bedroom. I am actually in Norway's capital city, Oslo. And before I explain why, although I guess the thumbnail will give you a hint, I want to take you back to February 2022. Back then, I was beginning my second semester of my Erasmus exchange in Salamanca, a city in Spain. And after having an amazing first semester, I was expecting more of the same. But between friends leaving, winter coming, and my new classes being way harder than I expected, it didn't really pan out that way. If you want more context, I wrote a short story called La Grua, which is available on IcarusMagazine.com, link in the description. In any case, I expected semester two to be easier than the first, but uh, it wasn't. It was tough, and in many ways tougher. A lot of the time I wanted to escape the world. One of the things I'd do is go to the department store El Corte Inglés, because I guess sometimes I really like consumerism, but also I used to go to the cinema. I know, I know, it all sounds very Steven Spielberg, but it's true. Every Monday at the CNA Van Dyke, tickets were only four euro, and that also was the only day of the week where they show films in their original language, or Bose. Versión original con subtítulos en español. Throw back to when I went to Dune at the start of the first semester and thought that its name in Spanish was Bose. <laughs> oh, language differences. Anyway, by the start of the second semester, I started going to the cinema with one of my friends, and there was this Norwegian film on called The Worst Person in the World. Now I'd seen some buzz around the film, especially after Cannes, and I was curious to engage with Norwegian cinema, given that its prominence in world cinema is significantly less than its Scandinavian counterpart Sweden and Denmark. But it was really the poster of this smiling woman under a provocative title that really made me want to check it out. So I saw the film, and you ever see a film that is just exactly what you needed to see? I've now watched the film five times, which is a lot for me, especially over such a short period of time. I own the Blu-ray, the movie one, not the Criterion one, because I was really disappointed with the cover of the Criterion one, and also the movie one came with art cards, which is just a key to my heart. And you saw the big poster I have in my room, which I actually bought in the bookshop that Yulia works in, so I have a thing for this movie. Which leads us back to today. This is my second time in Oslo. I have an auntie and uncle here, but between being a kid and the pandemic, I never had the chance to visit them. But after watching The Worst Person in the World, I knew I had to finally come here. So last October, I did. And it was a short and perfect escape from college, during which I did some very important sightseeing. And now I'm back. But my situation is not the same. If a year ago I was still protected by the cocoon of university, I'm not now. I am lost in my 20s. A shameful admission, I know. But something that a certain film from the land of skiing and hot dogs has a lot to say about. So why don't we talk about the worst person in the world? A film about being lost in your 20s. I.e. being in your 20s. Spoiler warning! The Worst Person in the World is an unconventional romantic comedy following a woman in her late 20s named Julia, played by Renate Reinsvig, and her relationship with two men, Axel, an edgy but successful graphic novelist played by Andres Danielson Lee, and Ivand, a young and cheerful barista played by Herbert Nordrum. It was directed by Joachim Trier and written by Trier and his longtime co-writer Eskil Volk. It's set in Oslo and unfolds in 14 sections, a prologue, 12 chapters, and an epilogue. The portrayal of being in your 20s and early 30s and the worst person in the world is marked by a combination of stasis and dynamism. On one hand, we have these energetic montages in the prologue, chapter 6 and chapter 7, introducing Yulia and Ivan's lives and relationships, along with freewheeling sequences such as the hilarious and touching section of chapter 2, wherein Yulia spontaneously crashes a wedding and meets Ivan for the first time, playing a game of chicken to test what is and isn't cheating, along with the now iconic world still sequence in chapter 5, in which Yulia runs through a frozen Oslo to spend time with Ivan before breaking up with Axel. These parts demonstrate the liberation of living in the moment. At the same time, so much of the film explores Yulia's downtime, where she's framed in crisp shots between vertical and horizontal lines that prefigure her feeling of entrapment, more acutely felt in her relationship with Axel, an older man whose desire to settle down and have children is just not something she's ready for, but also in her relationship with Ivand, whose apparent willingness to work as a barista for the rest of their lives is similarly terrifying to her. For Yulia, her simultaneous desire to move forward and fear of choosing the wrong path recalls the famous fig tree metaphor in Sylvia Plath's only novel, The Bell Jar. I saw my life branching out before me like the green fig tree in the story. From the tip of every branch, like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children, and another fig was a famous poet, 
and another fig was a brilliant professor. And beyond and above these figs were many more figs I couldn't quite make out. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of this fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one, they plopped to the ground at my feet. It's only when Axel suddenly dies that Yulia's perspective changes. The first time I watched The Worst Person in the World, it hit me like a train. At that time, I was the closest I ever got to dropping out of college. Things got a little hairy in fourth year, but by that point I was so close to the finish line that it was just like, well, I've gotten this far. But back in February 2022, things were tough. And the only thing keeping me in Spain was the fact that I didn't want to go back to Ireland. I wasn't ready to let go of the great life I had out there, and I didn't. Compared to Yulia, I must seem like someone who follows through on things, at least when it comes to university. Furthermore, like Axel, who Yulia envies for his assuredness in his career, I have a pretty good idea what I want to do for a living. The fact that it's not necessarily an easy living is another issue. And yet. And yet, I thoroughly relate to Yulia's combination of listlessness and energy, and a feeling of being stuck. But a transformation does happen, and it's not a gradual one resulting from the accumulation of experience through the plot, but more like an explosion, a crash, when Yulia finds out that Axel has cancer. To Yulia, Axel has done everything right. Edgelord though he may be, he has a flat, he has a career he's sure about, and uh, there's a baby crying over there, but we're just going to ignore that. And he has no fear of having kids. Ironic. And yet he gets cancer and dies. The narratives that structure Yulia's life, that in order to have a happy life she has to choose one of these figs, is rendered moot by Axel's death. Axel's death is heartbreaking, but also liberating for Yulia. It allows a massive weight to fall from her shoulders. By the end, she appears to be considerably more settled in herself. She has a photography job, a little flat, and the reveal in the epilogue that Ivan has a kid after they break up isn't portrayed as sad, instead it just reinforces the idea that the paths we follow are not set in stone. And this arc, wherein the ideas of what a happy life looks like are subverted, is illustrated stylistically by how the film goes from being the storybook romance, pretty music, narration and all, and melts into something that's rigid. Something I felt after the first time I watched The Worst Person in the World was that even if I did drop out of college, that's okay. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Doing everything right in life doesn't guarantee that's going to be any more fair. I'm only 22, much younger than even Yulia in the film, so I can't really say I fully internalized this perspective. Like Yulia, I still feel a lot of the weight of other people's expectations. Clearly, Yulia is a very capable person, but when she tries to go her own way, whether it's changing college courses, breaking up with boyfriends, or even dancing with old heads, she always feels like she's letting someone down. And the obvious over-internalizing of this shame is reflected in its title of the film. But now something new has been happening to me. In the last five months so, since finishing college, coming home, and trying to forge a new path, I don't look at my life in terms of a narrative. I don't think X will be such a great lesson for me, or why it will be such an important turning point in my life. Instead, I think it's a bit more like Axel says. I'm hesitant to view this current feeling as permanent. I just don't know what life's got in store for me. My whole life was laid out before me, from preschool to college, so... You know, I intentionally stepped off those rails, and that's scary. I'm taking a gap year, wanting to know what it's like to be free of these institutions in which I'm expected to go up the ranks in some way and, and be tied to. But even the term gap year confers certain expectations. Like, for example, that it doesn't last more than a year. Currently, like most Irish people my age, I live with my parents. And I'm recently unemployed, but I expect that to change soon. Like many Irish people my age, both now and historically, the burning question on my mind is, where will I emigrate to? But I don't want to turn this into a rant on how Ireland is a neoliberal hellscape. What I will say is that I think there's a lot of pressure on young people to appear like they have their lives sorted, to have their lives on track. But what that looks like 
as the worst person in the world illustrates, is different for everyone, at every time in history. By the end of the film, Yulia appears to be more content in herself, but only after everything that came before. It was all a part of the journey, not a flaw, but a feature. And sound even more like a self-help guru who definitely isn't trying to sell you questionable supplements, I want to give you a quote from a friend of my uncle's. He's a retired film professor and he told me he tells young people, don't be in such a rush to find your role. Pursue different things. Be willing to explore. And cheat on your boyfriend. He didn't say that explicitly, but I think it was implied. Alright, and we are doing it in this one. Uh, it's a little late. Uh, that's just kind of the way it's gone this time. If you hear my PlayStation screaming, that is because I'm currently playing 2K. Um, but yeah, I just want to say uh, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, I want to give a shout out to my brother, Oshin for not only helping me with filming, but giving me some really helpful feedback on uh, the original script, which led me to make some pretty significant changes uh, to the video, but that I think were for the best. Um, I also want to thank my auntie and uncle, John and Lena, for uh, letting us stay with them and being such great hosts. Um, just made our stay so much better. Uh, Oslo is a terrific city. I really recommend visiting. Uh, a little expensive, but uh, if you're coming from Ireland, it's not <laughs> it's not that much more expensive. Um, as long as you just don't ever eat out or, or drink alcohol, and you'll be fine. So, yeah, um, do that.